Hi, and welcome back to 19th and 20th Century Philosophy. I'm Matt Brown, and today we're talking about John Dewey. John Dewey was born in 1859, not long before the start of the Civil War, and he died in 1952, seven years after the devastation of World War II. Um, he lived through, obviously, a period of uh, incredible technological change as well as social change uh, in the United States. Um, he was born in Vermont, uh, grew up there, went to university there, um, and then he worked principally in uh, at the University of Michigan, University of Chicago, and then Columbia University uh, at, in New York City. Dewey is most well known for his philosophy of education, uh, his social and political philosophy. He's known as the philosopher of democracy. But during his career, he wrote um, important works in nearly every field of philosophy you could think of. His collected works run some 38 long volumes covering 70 years of publications um, from 1882 to 1953. Um, John Dewey is an interesting figure for, for many reasons, um, an interesting figure for us to look at in particular. Um, he's one of the key early figures of American pragmatism. Um, he follows shortly um, after Charles Peirce and William James. In fact, Peirce was one of his uh, graduate school teachers at John Hopkins University. Um, and he's roughly contemporary with Jane Addams, uh, who had a major influence on him and, and he on her as well. Our concept of the pragmatist tradition in philosophy is largely due, uh, I think, to Dewey's work, um, the way uh, he, he thought about um, pragmatism, uh, not only because of his longevity, um, his writing career was uh, itself much longer than uh, most of the other pragmatists, uh, what we would call the classical pragmatists, um, uh, he also wrote reflectively about um, the American philosophical tradition um, and about pragmatism specifically. Um, that said, he, he also had a, a, a love-hate relationship with the concept of pragmatism um, and uh, sometimes eschewed it in, in favor of other terms. Dewey is also interesting because uh, he was part of the first generation of American academic philosophers to be um, fully professionally trained. You know, most of the... Um, figures of Dewey's period sort of fit this, um, fit this mold. Um, most of Dewey's own teachers had to go to Europe for serious philosophical training, uh, or they were largely self-taught, right? Um, but uh, Dewey was, um, uh, was trained to do philosophy in a serious contemporary way um, in the US, and, and that's a significant difference, I think. Dewey is also one of the last academic philosophers who was also a really prominent public intellectual, right? So today, um, it's, it's somewhat more rare to find academic philosophers in America um, who are also public intellectuals. Um, Dewey founded um, the laboratory school at the University of Chicago where he pursued educational innovations, uh, really tested out um, theories of education, philosophies and theories of education. Um, and he was active in Jane Addams Social Settlement, uh, the Hull House. Um, he uh, also headed the International Commission of Inquiry that cleared Leon Trotsky of the charges made by Stalin at the Moscow show trial. So Dewey, along with several other figures, traveled to Mexico in uh, 1937 uh, to clear Trotsky of those tr charges. Well, to, to review the charges, and, and they ended up deciding that he was not actually guilty of what Stalin said he had done. Dewey actually ends up having a kind of uh, significant indirect effect on um, Barack Obama. Um, Dewey's granddaughter, Alice, uh, Dewey um, was a um, anthropologist and was uh, Ann Dunham's dissertation supervisor, Ann Dunham being Barack Obama's mother. Um, also, when they lived in Chicago, the Obama's uh, children went to school at the laboratory school. So just little factoids, but interesting connections, I think. 
Dewey began his career in philosophy in the 1880s, um, very much influenced on the one hand by German idealism, Hegel in particular, and on the other hand by the new experimental psychology, um, which he had learned from Hall at Johns Hopkins. Um, he sought in his own work to, or early work to reconcile the two. But largely, I think, thanks to the influence of, of Charles Darwin's um, uh, evolutionary theory and the psychology of William James, which was published in 1890, um, for Dewey, uh, in Dewey's thinking, a, a kind of evolutionary naturalism came to replace the role of absolute idealism in his thinking. Um, now, um, one name for his philosophy you know, I mentioned that Dewey had a kind of love-hate relationship with the, the term pragmatism. He also uh, used and discarded uh, terms like experimentalism and instrumentalism for his view. But one name he, for his philosophy that Dewey flirted with was, was cultural naturalism. And one of the things that's nice about the term cultural naturalism is that the naturalism captures Dewey's strong and long-lasting commitment to the continuity of nature and the human, um, the continuity also of science and philosophy. Um, uh, and you know, Dewey's kind of swimming upstream on that point um, in, the, in the early 20th century. Um, Dewey's, but it's also cultural naturalism. So, so Dewey, uh, the term cultural there for Dewey is emphasizing that humanity is a social organism. The medium in which we live is, is culture, right? Um, by which he means communication through language and other media, um, the construction of our world through artifacts um, and, and sort of the built environment, um, and the sort of cooperative enterprises that characterize um, uh, democratic governance. In this later view, some of Hegel's influence still survives. Um, Hegel had emphasized the active nature of human intelligence as against, um, say, the, the empiricists or the rationalists who had a kind of receptive um, view of human intelligence. Dewey's very much still Hegelian in that sense. Not only is, it, is human intelligence active, but it, it's active in shaping the world, right? And Dewey's also Hegelian in, this, in his insistence that um, Philosophy is, is always bound to its sort of historical, cultural, institutional moment. Okay, but for Dewey, both of these thoughts are fully naturalized, right? So it's not that intelligence shapes the world in any sort of um, mysterious way or because the real is the rational and the rational is the real or anything like that. Um, literally, what intelligence is for is, is um, physically... Um, and socially reshaping the world, right? Dewey's um, philosophy really centers on a concept that in some places he calls organism-environment interaction, right? Um, or sometimes transaction, he uses that language as well. You know, Dewey's a pragmatist in the sense, or an instrumentalist in the sense that he thinks of philosophical conceptions as tools for getting into a better relation with the world. So his, his epistemology and his metaphilosophy are, are very much problem solving oriented, right? His logical theory as well, very much in, uh, sort of emphasizing um, problem solving for uh, problems that are of, of sort of human uh, relevance, relevant to human practices. Right? Now, the essay you read uh, for this class uh, this week, The Need for a Recovery of Philosophy, presents an interesting, I think, contrast to emerging practices and conceptions in the philosophical world at the time. So, you know, while a, a little bit before this time, uh, on, into, on, on into the 19-teens, you know, um, a lot of our proto-analytic and proto-continental philosophers are... Um, arguing for a kind of anti-psychologism, right? Um, which, is, which is a kind of anti-naturalism. It's an argument for a separation between science and philosophy, between the, the subject matter of philosophy and the subject matter of, of the natural world. Um, Dewey is, is developing a kind of naturalism, right? Which, uh, which emphasizes continuity. 
Dewey is um, laying out what he would call an empirical theory of experience, right? Um, as against those assumptions about experience, which he thinks are theoretically driven, um, which we see in classical empiricism, rationalism, and idealism from the early modern and, and, and modern periods um, into, into the 20th century. In the need for a recovery of philosophy, Dewey contrasts philosophy focused on the problems of philosophers uh, versus philosophy that's focused on the, what he calls the problem of men, or if he was using a more contemporary, less sexist language, we would say the problems of humanity or, or of humans, right? Dewey here is fighting against a certain way of professionalizing the discipline of philosophy, right? So one thing that characterizes professionalized academic disciplines or scholarly disciplines is that they have their own sort of characteristic concerns, right? Physicists aren't so much concerned with um, building a better bridge or uh, uh, building a better combustion engine. They're, they're focused on um, concerns about particles and forces and laws of nature that are driven really by the internal focus of the discipline. Although Dewey emphasizes the um, uh, continuity of science and philosophy, he doesn't think philosophy should professionalize in that way. And, and ultimately, he thinks, you know, although physicists are focused on very abstract and what might seem like recherche problems, in the end, um, the value of physics is that it does increase our capacity to predict and control the natural world, right? Um, and so, uh, although that may seem remote, um, ultimately, it's always present there in the, in the methods of, of natural science. You know, we can contrast, I think, Dewey's view with that of, of Frege or Husserl, both of whom are kind of concerns with foundations, right? Um, they're concerned with the sort of, you know, what Dewey would call questions about knowledge or questions about reality, überhaupt, right? Uh, which is just German for in general, right? Um, uh, the sort of wholesale un, uh, analysis of knowledge or reality, um, rather than taking things in their plurality and particularity, right? So Dewey really wants us to think about things in terms of their their specificity um, and and the various the great variety of things that we encounter in in uh, in our daily world. All right, so that's a short introduction to to Dewey um, and uh, his his sort of background, his thinking, um, and some of the things that make the uh, essay, The Need for a Recovery of Philosophy, interesting in context of the other readings we've been talking about. Um, I look forward to digging into the details of that piece with you um, on Discord or in the comments here in the video or in our um, synchronous class meeting later today. Um, hope you're having a good week and I'll see you next time.